First of all, thank you very much for everybody attending today. I know it's Thursday afternoon, 3 p.m., and this is a <laughs> probably last session that you're going to attend, so I really appreciate everybody coming here today. Um, I would like to say first probably welcome, or benvenuti, or welcome, or bienvenidos, because we have the luxury to have here uh, three uh, very nice colleagues and friends of mine that are going to present this session with me. Uh, you probably are thinking on some old jokes from your childhood when you were thinking, what does an American, an Spanish, a German, and an Italian are doing in the same room, right? So, <laughs> 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 so it's not to say that IoT is so complicated that you need people from all over the world to figure it out. <laughs> that probably is true, depending who you ask. Uh, but no, uh, certainly all joking aside, thank you very much for coming and joining us today uh, in the name of Red Hat. A uh, quick round of intros. Uh, um, our friends, uh, first starting from the left, uh, Franco Porepan, he is the product manager from Eurotech. Uh, David Schumann is the IoT industry lead from Cloudera. And we have also Vito de Galliano coming from Italy, from Milan, who is the uh, industrial IoT solutions manager from Bosch. Right? So the structure of the presentation is going to be the following. We're going to introduce the solution architecture that Eurotech, Red Hat, and uh, Cloudera have put together. And then we'll show you how we uh, make that, ar that architecture real through a POC that we did in the manufacturing uh, facility in Milan, in Crema, with our good colleagues of uh, Bosch. So let's kick this off. I'm David Bericat from Red Hat. Uh, I'm on the Global Partner Organization, and I'm an IoT architect on that team. So first of all, uh, you try to break that down, uh, the challenges that an IoT end-to-end uh, -end architecture or solution is going to bring to the table. This is the way we structure them. We typically try to oversimplify that so people don't freak out on two problems, a data problem and a management problem. But at the end of the day, the different building blocks that you're going to need to provision or provide uh, are sort of summarized in this slide. Uh, first, uh, it all starts with connecting the physical world to your uh, rest of your digital world, right? We're in a digital transformation journey, right? But at the end of the day, there are physical things and physical machines generating some information that we're going to need to securely connect and gather information from uh, to start speaking, right? That's what we call uh, the data journey, and is uh, getting all that uh, real-time uh, telemetry stream and flowing that from where it's generated to the rest of the architecture, right? You need to be able to do that through the different crazy world of operational technology protocols that are out there, that you just to name some, some of them, OPC UA, OPC DA, Modbus, Canvas of the walls. So probably you guys have some experience with those, right? It's, it's really funny. It's a very heterogeneous uh, world. And, and very specific by itself. Eurotech is providing expertise on that area for the past probably 20, 25 years. So we're very, very happy to have them in the partnership. You move a little bit to the right, uh, the whole intelligent edge processing and analytics is what everybody is trying to do right now, right? We want to push traditional functions and building blocks that we've been doing in the, in the cloud or in your backend for the past probably 10, 15, 20 years closer to the edge. Uh, why is that? Because the whole edge computing or intelligent processing, uh, the whole optimizing your network consumption and not paying a lot of money, transmitting data back and forth, uh, raw telemetry data that really don't give you any value. And uh, we only want to pre-process that data, get the information that you need, and send only what is meaningful for the rest of the business. All that is intelligent edge processing and analytics uh, that is able to by deploying machine learning models at the edge, which is kind of a super hype trend that everybody's speaking about, being able to actually take and predict decisions without uh, the need for connectivity and without the latency of sending all that information to the backend and coming back, and effectively take decisions automatically based on those uh, streams, right? If you go to more of the uh, traditional uh, backend applications and you're thinking more on a uh, Analytics, typical world, big data with uh, Hadoop, Spark, Spark ML, and all those trends. Uh, we're starting to talk about how you can create a centralized data view of your data. Some people will say that's a lake. 
Some people will say that's a bunch of streams that need to be consistent enough uh, to offer all that unified 360 degrees of data to your data scientists, your data engineers, or your applications, so they can meaningfully create those machine learning models and those analytical models uh, to be able to infer a value to the business and being able to, depending on the use case and depending on the industry, uh, be able to add value to that business, right? At the end of the day, uh, we're in Red Hat, the whole modern app development. You probably have heard OpenSea between 1,000 and 5,000 times for the past uh, three days. We're very excited to, to push all that innovation in modern application development. Applications are keen, uh, and if you're not able to provide value to the business through those applications and get all that real-time data and merge that and offer that to your application layer, you're basically uh, wasting a lot of uh, very nice competitive advantage with your uh, other players in the market. And at the end of the day, we don't usually talk much about that, but the whole end-to-end -end security and compliance, it's something that we probably take for granted most of the time. We don't we even forget talking about that. But you don't have that at every single tier of the architecture uh, and in IoT that's paramount because we're connecting a bunch of things to the internet that is going to have some risk out of the box by definition. Uh, then you're going to get into trouble, right? You're going to have security breaches, you're not able to secure your endpoints, uh, encrypt your data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. then you, you're doing yourself not a very nice favor, right? People know that there are a bunch of IoT players and IoT frameworks and IoT platforms out there, and they always ask us the same question. Why is Red Hat and our partner ecosystem and the Eclipse IoT Working Group uh, different from the others? specifically because of that word, which is ecosystem, right? We are Red Hat, that's what we do. We create communities, we create partners, we endorse uh, projects, and basically even uh, <laughs> representing both here, we have our good friend Vito, but uh, the whole digital transformation or moving from a traditional proprietary close uh, software development model uh, to that quote that uh, Mr or Dr. Stefan Ferber, who is the new chairman and CEO of Bosch Software Innovations, that I think is a good summary of why the future of development I is open source. You probably can't can beat that, so I'm not going to even repeat that, but there's a bunch of very nice play players that uh, have think or thought that open source is the way to go, and the Eclipse IoT Working Group is the venue that we're endorsing and working with our partners in creating software for the IoT uh, space. How do we do that? Well, well first, uh, as a bunch of techies and engineers, we thought that a bunch of slides is not enough. So we took all the different products and technologies, and we spent probably for the past two years or two years and a half, uh, and more recently, very intensively uh, for the past year with our friends in Cloudera, uh, creating uh, what we call an open, end-to-end, uh, -end, open source, standard-based uh, architecture that is modular and flexible. We took the different probably 10, 12 products and different projects underneath, and we made sure that those work together, are pre-integrated, uh, they work, and, and we felt confident going to customers and real POCs like what we did with Bosch, uh, with the guarantees that that's going to work, right? So uh, that's the way we represent the solution architecture that we put together. You have all the things connected with the IoT gateway layer that is logical, can be one gateway, can be a network of gateways, can be, uh, you can start adding more hype words like fog computing and things like that that are edge by default. At the end of the day, you're moving all that information to uh, your open hybrid cloud-based IoT hub. Uh, that hub is a bunch of IoT uh, defined micros microservices that can run anywhere on prem, on public cloud providers, multi cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So you want that flexibility across different environments to move that workloads. Uh, obviously, you're, you're thinking that uh, Linux containers and orchestration with Kubernetes are going to play an important role there for us. And uh, when you transition all that uh, data uh, to uh, a centralized data hub uh, is when you start uh, engaging with the traditional analytics world, where Cloudera obviously is a key uh, leader uh, in this space. 
where they're going to do everything from store the information, uh, do the traditional analytics models, uh, create those, train those, and offer that uh, business value to the enterprise application world uh, that uh, is out there on the right, right? So summarizing a little bit the different functional building blocks that I've been saying into where they sit in at every single tier of the architecture, I think this is a good summary. We talk about how to connect uh, in just uh, transform the raw data into meaningful information, uh, apply some business logic and create some edge applications or IoT specific applications at the edge, at the gateway level. That gateway level, think about it as a combination of a software stack that can be deployed anywhere. It can be software defined, it can run on different hardware providers, different industrial gateways, uh, different open hardware platforms like Raspberry Pi's of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Intel architecture, ARM architecture, we really don't care. We really focus on putting the software pieces together and making sure that they work. Uh, we talk a lot about data, but from the device management perspective is when things really get interesting in IoT. It's about the explosion of uh, the different devices and infrastructure that you're gonna need to deploy at the edge. Think about thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of things. Uh, probably you hear there are a bunch of global companies that we talk every single day and it's like, hey, when you're trying to do 10, this is easy. When you're trying to do 10,000, it gets interesting. And when you're trying to do 10 million, is when your head explodes, right? If you, don't have, if you don't have the capabilities to do this at a scale, at global scale, in different areas where you don't have internet connectivity guaranteed, and you have cellular, and you have GPRS, and you don't have fiber channel all day long, like <laughs> what you're used to, is when it gets uh, interesting. Uh, so you need to provide the device management capabilities to actually do things at that level, right? Uh, obviously, we talk about the analytics uh, layer. I'll let our good friends from Cloudera explain more about that. And applications, at the end of the day, uh, you're gonna need to integrate with different services and different existing enterprise IT uh, data stores and other applications uh, so we can uh, make the most of connecting this new uh, real-time world with data generated at the edge with your existing traditional IT applications and services. So with that, uh, probably you're thinking, okay, that's cool, but this is a Red Hat event, so I wanna see a bunch of Red Hat products. Where, <laughs> where are the Red Hat products and where they fit, right? So you can see here uh, that we're doing integration at the edge and messaging at the edge uh, with Fuse and INQ. We actually have Camel integrated at that edge to facilitate integration uh, and ingest data from different points, uh, coordinated with the operational technology uh, middleware piece from Eurotech called a word software framework or ESF. We have a Fuse and INQ also running at the IoT hub to do the whole MQTT based messaging ingestion and also a command and control uh, with again ANQ and Fuse for integration. And obviously all those services are running on a, a OpenSIF a container platform that is giving you the portability across the different environments on-prem or on in the cloud, right? One of the most complaints uh, or highest complaints we get from customers and partners is that, yeah, I love the public cloud development model and going and doing everything very easily, but at the end of the day, in terms of compliance or in terms of I don't wanna share my data and push all my data to a cloud and then consume that, I want that on-prem and I want that at my manufacturing facilities, et cetera, et cetera, like what Bosch needed at some point, right? So uh, with that, obviously we have uh, Cloudera at uh, the analytics uh, tier, and obviously we have OpenSIF and the rest of our middleware services from Red Hat uh, to create those enterprise applications. So uh, our good friend Franco is gonna explore more the IoT Gateway stack and the IoT Integration Hub. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you for the overview. Thank you for the details. Now we will drill a little bit on each of these pillars in the architecture. So. Um, let us focus on the first one, uh, edge prophecy analytics. There is where we call it edge. Computing happens in edge analytics. Um, and we call the implementation of that, how we actually uh, uh, put that into the teal is we use gateways. Uh, that is the hardware part of it. And uh, we put software in there that Dave already mentioned is the everywhere software framework. The architecture in the title of this session is open. So you remember that 
uh, these, the ESF has actually has been contributed to Eclipse uh, in the project uh, Kula. And we will draw, drill down into this detail uh, in the next slide. Uh, the next one will be uh, the uh, cloud part. So what is happening in the cloud? Uh, the everywhere cloud is the product. Uh, the project is uh, Kapua that you probably already heard uh, several times. So let us drill down. This is the core of what is happening inside the gateway. And this is the software that sits at that level. So um, the first thing is the connectivity. The first thing that our clients are asking us is, OK, I have several sensors. I have legacy systems. I have uh, intelligent systems deployed in the manufacturing plant. How do I connect uh, all that data? How do I publish all that data to the cloud? So first of all, connectivity uh, towards these devices and these sensors. Uh, the complexity in there is uh, very high. So what we did is create a level of abstraction in the software in order to treat all these different protocols, MOBAS, OPC UI, Softinet, ES7, Siemens protocol, uh, in a unified way. So this unified way is exposed up to uh, the core part of uh, everywhere software framework, which is a development environment. So you don't care at that point uh, dealing with the uh, specific, you know, CAN bus or USB, or you're using Bluetooth low energy. You have just the data exposed in a common way, regardless of where that data is coming from. Another thing that we heard from our clients is that sometimes in these environments, they don't really like to develop. So even if it's Java, it's a pretty common, uh, probably the number one or number two programming language in the world. They say, I don't want to learn that. I don't want to hire people doing the applications at the gateway at the edge uh, using a programming language. So what we developed is what we call WIRES. It's a data flow programming model in which you have pre-built components. You just drag and drop them uh, into a canvas, into a graph, as we call it, and you connect them. So what are these components? These components, as I said, the abstraction le level of those protocols or uh, digital input output and so on are represented as uh, assets. So basically, if you want to connect, uh, and probably some of you already went to the demo down in the uh, uh, expo part, uh, we represent a device like as a component, and you connect that component to a publisher, and immediately you start publishing data without writing a single line of code. And that is very well received because it's like you're starting with a uh, with an empty whiteboard. You don't know where to start, and this really uh, allows you with a couple of components to start collecting and publishing the data up to the cloud. Um, and then connectivity to the cloud. So obviously we can connect to, uh, as I mentioned, the everywhere cloud. You get uh, additional features and uh, device management doing that. We will see that in a minute. But uh, we are open. So does this gateway uh, want to connect to uh, Amazon? Yes. Uh, to Azure? Yes. To Eclipse Kapua, which is the open source part of it? Absolutely. So a single gateway not only can connect to any different cloud, and we are glad that the MQTT protocol that we are using really has become not only an international standard now, but a de facto standard from the edge to the cloud. Um, we can also do multiple connections at the same time. So and this is a difficult scenario that we've seen from, from all of our engagements. Uh, what about if my data is private? I really don't want to send it there. I want to send it to my data center. So you have one connection to the data for your data center, one connection uh, for the device management to everywhere cloud, and so on. You can really architect this in a very modular way. How did we implement all this? So another level of drilling down into the architecture of that. These are the what we call smart services that are exposed inside uh, the framework. Um, let us call it libraries in the old-fashioned way, right? You can notice uh, the upper level here, um, the applications. Now, you can do an application writing uh, Java code, or you can now write an application using this data flows wires abstraction, because we also expose those components in, an up in you know, a programming way in order to use them. Uh, you see here in blue the cloud services, additional services that allow to do more than just uh, telemetry data up to the cloud. You can do device management, many interesting other things. And you see here the abstractions that we have. 
Again, the title open, uh, integrated. So it's nice because we can put these little components, they, these are modulars, they represent uh, an industrial protocol like OPC UA. Uh, we provide many of them, but other contributors in the open source community can provide other protocols, legacy protocols, uh, new protocols, newer versions of that. Uh, in the Clips uh, marketplace, you can actually post these components and literally drag and drop them into the application environment and suddenly have a new protocol supported in your uh, edge environment. And many other things like obviously the, uh, the web interface in order to interact directly uh, with the gateway. And then we go one level up in the tier, which is everywhere cloud. First of all, uh, you see here the gateway now is just a little part here. Here we see a, a hardware gateway here with ESF inside. Uh, secure connection between uh, the gateway and the cloud. Secure connection not only for telemetry data, but also for device management. So we have one single pipe going with MQTT protocol, for example, in which uh, everything is transmitted and controlled. What are the main features uh, of this part, this module of the entire architecture? Well, we call it the integration hub. So uh, connectivity uh, for data, external applications, uh, piping the data to additional uh, functionality. Cloudera will be the perfect example today, but also device management. And uh, there is a function that we call provisioning, which is basically bootstrapping these devices that are spread around in the field all over the world. So you connect for the first time and you want that to be secure. You want to, to be sure that that device has a unique ID and connects to the proper server. And you want to download the initial configuration. You want to download your initial applications remotely. These devices can be in places that are not accessible. Uh, these devices can be on mobile devices, on mobile uh, buses or other uh, places uh, that are not fixed. And you want to do that uh, securely, and not only for the uh, initial configuration, but also for the lifecycle management. What, what about if you want to uh, put a new version of your application? Obviously, you don't have to go to the gateway. You can roll that out uh, worldwide, uh, selecting groups of uh, devices in order to do that uh, in an optimized way. And this is what, you know, batch operations and group, you can, you know, say, okay, this is the uh, Asia uh, sets of devices. I want to update them on Tuesday. I want to do the update on the European ones on Friday and so on. There is a concept that actually is fresh in the, in the new, newest version of this uh, tool, in which is the digital twin. So not only we provide these hardware abstraction as a little component that you can wire and create applications, but there is also, we push this concept all the way up to the cloud. So you really can see the state and you can act upon the digital representation of your device that is all the way down here. So I'm talking about the digital representation of this intelligence device connected to the gateway and represented digitally at, um, at the cloud level. And uh, you can read what is happening. You can actually act upon uh, the controls that you have in order to change the field and create a full uh, control loop. How did we do this? And this is uh, another drill down of the uh, Everywhere Cloud uh, set of tools. Again, modular. Remember that uh, we are just one part of a bigger architecture. We use uh, components and software for all the partners that we have right here. Uh, for example, uh, JBoss Fusey here, which is kind of important at this level because you may have some messages that need uh, some rerouting, uh, that need some transformation, and you may create different pipes to another applications, to a database or to wherever, right? And the capability of having this already pre-integrated is it's fundamental. Um, obviously, other completely custom integration can be done uh, because we expose the entire functionality of the integration hub uh, with REST API. There is much more than that. I, I would just limit my time here. <laughs> Otherwise, I eat the time for my colleagues in here. Um, if your connection between the edge and the cloud is uh, with cellular uh, 
with a cellular breather uh, provider, then you need to manage those SIMs and, and, and have us something that relates your device with the SIM and so on. So we provide that too. And uh, just one more. Okay, so we focused on the IoT gateways, on the integration uh, hub, and now we will continue into the drill down of the different parts. We continue okay. the journey, yes, We indeed. continue the journey. All right, so we got things. We got things connected and moving data. Wait, we have data. This gets interesting now, because now we're going to take this, and we're going to move it on in the journey here. There are a couple very interesting patterns that we see that happen along this as we start to think about this more than, than from the things component here, but now let's get into the data component on here. You'll get a northbound pattern and a southbound pattern. Let's talk about going north first. Uh, from left to right, that's sort of the north. We talked a little bit about protocol translation. How do we go ahead and acquire the data? Um, there's some important things that are happening along the way here as far as the data is considered on this. We're going to be doing things in that northbound pattern like filtering data. Um, not all data gets transmitted across this. It, at many points along the way, we're going to be making decisions about what is important and what moves on. That de those decisions have to be instilled into the parts of the architecture of the left. And that's going to be an interesting point that we'll come to is how do we make those decisions and how do we make that updatable, adjustable based on the business criteria. Um, often that you'll see these devices out there are spewing out far more data than we really want to transmit on this. We have like a piece of machinery out there that's working at 3,000 cycles per second. Each cycle is creating a, a piece of data on that. We can't, there's not enough network in the world to flow all that data up there. We're gonna make decisions about filtering, aggregation, decisions, and routing that Frank was talking about on this as it's moving up northbound through the telemetry part on this. But there's equally a southbound pattern on this as well. With that data, we want to build decision-making processes. And whether these are business rules that are being created and move southbound into the architecture to be closer to where the data is being generated, or if this is more towards machine learning models. How do I create intelligence at the edge where if I have this process that, you know, every human being in this room agrees on exactly what it's going to be, you know what's really good at doing exactly that kind of thing? Is a machine learning model. But I need to train that model on data. I need to use data to generate the insights that are then going to be instantiated at the edge. And we need to have a framework in place that allows us to change that over time. We may have a model that's effective at 50 degrees centigrade, that as it drops to 40 or 30 or 20, all of a sudden we're going to need to change the parameters around the model. And that model has to be updated. We have to have that flow, that command and control that Franco was just talking about there that does just that thing. So I'm going to talk about three key patterns here along the way. We have one key pattern, which is how do I build, how do I instantiate a corpus of data? How do I pull this in to be able to build enough data for me to work with my enterprise and build applications off of this? And this is your streaming ingest pattern. From Kapua or the Everywhere Cloud here that we see here in, in, in you know, figure 1.0 in that, we're starting to build in small streams of data that are coming in from devices that get aggregated together. We start getting larger and larger components of this, and now I've got kind of a big pipe of data that's coming in. I need something that's got big pipe kind of capabilities on that. We look at this in the architecture then at saying that's Kafka. Kafka's really super efficient at having that consistency of message processing at high volumes, and what the Everywhere Cloud and Kapua have done for us is aggregated all those small streams together to be able to create that big pipe. Now I've got data coming in, I have my messaging framework, I now need to do logic and perform business logic on that. And this is done within the Apache Spark project in here. And Spark and Spark Streaming are two very powerful frameworks, whether you see that for batch or for stream processing on that. And within Spark, we're going to consume that message. Kafka's going to hand off a message to us, we're going to grab the message, decoupled from the generation of the message process, parse that, and it's typically in a binary format as it comes through, enrich it, we'll do some value normalization, uh, adjust for time series data that's coming in there, um, and then persist that. And along the way, we may do things to the data, like we had a timestamp that was generated when the message started. We may take another timestamp in here that says we've processed that, and I append that in there, 
and then I'm going to write that back to a storage substrate of some nature. Um, lots of different storage capabilities that are out there within the Apache ecosystem. One that's really interesting for this is a project called Apache Kudu. So Apache Kudu within this allows you to have two very different kinds of access patterns around data. Um, one where you're having a long store of data where I want to be able to read over the full corpus of data. And the other, which is I would typically want to do random lookups uh, and in fact updates on data. And typically within the Apache community, you had actually seen that driven into two different areas. The greatness of the Apache Hadoop and uh, Hadoop distributed file system on one side. And if you're picking up that other pattern, you're doing something like Apache HBase. And so that gets you, got you to a complicated Lambda architecture that you were solving this with. Kudu is a singular storage substrate that actually solves both of those problems. And we use that here in the architecture to be able to persist that data um, and then allow us to do things like historical queries on that. So we have one pattern. We screen and ingest the data. But we also want to be able to process that data in flight and do streaming data analytics. And so you're going to see that pattern start off very similarly on here. We're taking the big pipes now coming in from Kapua. We're bringing that in through Kafka. We're starting to do that parsing and spark streaming. Um, and with that, we're using the magic piece here in 3.4, which is the model. You said, wait, you haven't shown me where the model got created. I'll come back to that. So now we have here, we've decoupled that consumption. We're parsing that back out. We're doing our normalization. And then we're instantiating and using a model on that and feeding that back into the stream to be used in our application force. All right, things are going left to right here. We're pulling stuff in. Now we're down to the point here where you say, well, we're going to make a machine learning model. We start with all that data that we've been aggregating over this time to build out the model. We want to have a good long series of time series data that allows us to look at the behavior of our devices over time. And we're ingesting that back the other way via Spark comes back into that. So within Spark now, we're loading the data that comes up from this persistent store. We're building out this machine learning, the supervised learning preparation, extracting our meaningful identifier and labels on that. And we're building and training a model. Um, and that's typically a very iterative process as I find a model that fits to my data. And once I have that, I now can then deploy this model where it makes sense in the architecture. I can do this up in here in my machine learning platform, or I can take that model and ship it closer to where the actual action was happening. And one of the ways that that can be done is using a markup language called PMML. And so PMML is a fairly lightweight, looks kind of like XML method of shipping machine learning models around. And that goes back into Kafka, into a different topic. And now I can push that out to the edge back in through Kapua, which now can control back to the particular devices that Franco was talking about earlier, and that ability to have command and control. So this is how you train a model. And then on the inverse side of that, you flip and you move that model back out and in the edge. One of the things that we will be showing you around this, um, and we'll at the end of this presentation, we'll show you a link that you can go to to actually be able to see a demo, is something that showed you both of those patterns where I'm ingesting streaming data in, and then I want to be able to build a model that is executed in my machine, in the, my, my cluster, in my machine learning uh, environment on that. And with that, I may have a lot of contextual data that's, that's infusing in this. And in the case of the demo that we've built, we're taking in data about scheduling and parts and machines. But the other side on this is I may want to ship that model out where it executes at the edge. And in fact, when you go to see the demo that's at that link at the end, you'll actually see an instance where the, the model is reacting to data right there at the edge generated by the machine and sending up those alerts without having to go make that round trip back into the cluster. So, Vito, let's talk a little bit here because we actually had an opportunity uh, with Bosch at your facility outside of Crema, which by the way, Fantastic place to go to. Offenango, but it's great. <laughs> Offenango, but it's in <laughs> Just right, to be near to the big parts on the map. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I got Italy and I started working my way down from that taxonomically uh, to actually go in and do a proof of concept. So you're an industrial engineer within this. You've been within Bosch for over 20 years and focus on industry 4.0 very specifically over the last five, five years in that transformation. Tell us a little bit about your role within Bosch. Yeah. 
So I'm industrial IoT solution manager. I'm working as part of a, a DevOps team in one of the um, biggest business units of Bosch, which is a powertrain solution. And our team is in charge to increase the, mm, yeah, the digital digitization, the digital transformation of our production manu and manufacturing area plants. And um, yeah, we are so called also accelerator with an X, so accelerator, because this is basically one, one motto that we have. We have to accelerate the speed, we have to increase the speed to transform these uh, digital transformation because we see the benefit to catch not only the low hanging fruits of bringing the data into a sort of uh, available storage, but also keep uh, advantage of uh, the skills that we already. Uh, continuously increase to to make this happen. So, super. So we we went in to do a, a proof of concept, yeah. and I, I love our little photo montage there from from our, our week in uh, Ofenango. Um, and there were, there was sort of a design around this. What did we want to prove in this proof of concept? Uh, and what were some of the success criteria? Yeah, basically we wanted to uh, prove that an end-to-end uh, -end integrated open source architecture is working in an existing uh, production manufacturing environment with existing IT, enterprise IT, and also with different situations like, for example, security zone where the, um, the data cannot be directly transmitted, but there are some firewalls and so on. So for security reasons, we need to keep them separate from the enterprise office area and so on and uh, let this work. So from the beginning, from end to end, this was one, uh, one of the objectives we had. The other one was um, taking also open source and um, for example, Eclipse tools that are already existing and integrating in an existing landscape uh, with existing um, IT tools that we are using and also with the machines without managing to go and change something directly on the, the machines itself, but using the what we gain from this concept and uh, look how it works, how it's integrated. And uh, stretching then this proof of concept, we wanted also to check if, for example, machine learning is also available with this deck because that was also, it's one of the interesting parts. It's not only collecting data, but managing the training of these, uh, based on the data, some models, bringing back to the, yeah, like you mentioned, where the execution is done, basically, or the decision. This was, um, yeah, our focus. Okay. And the criteria, sorry, <laughs> the criteria was exactly this is interesting. I said, when I saw these slides that Dave and uh, David, they presented to me the first time, I said, okay, you know what, show me. I will give you, I will hand over a Bosch XDK sensor, which is like uh, a sensor where you can use for uh, proof of concepts, program it, and I say, I want to see this data on an, a tool that we have, for example, in our in private cloud, for example. Perfect. So this was the criteria. When we started the week, I, I love the, on the upper left-hand side, we had that blank sheet of paper that was up there. We started drawing out the components of the architecture for the, the pieces that we wanted to do. As the week went on, we kept adding other modules into it. And so we talked about that open and interoperability that was in here, but it was very interesting that as we started to, as we continued to, to progress the data from the device through to the gateway, through to the hub, we then started to say, what else could we add into that architecture? Yeah, modul modularity basically is really one of the things that, uh, or I mean, adding these new components is really relevant for a manufacturing plant because, uh, you know, we have a, such a, everybody has such a variety of technology, of data to be transmitted, and also of, um, let me say, enterprise IT that they are using. So you need to be flexible enough to plug and play components, pieces of the, of the architecture to make it work, not only from a proof of concept, but to make it also available for other use cases that we have. And I mean, we have a lot of them. And um, yeah, it's like a Lego bricks. You have standard components, you bring them together as you need, and they will fit together. So we laid out these success criteria. Um, yeah, exactly. Did we achieve those within the week? Yes, we did, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm really glad about that. <laughs> well, in this end-to-end -end architecture, we took a particular component in here, the Bosch XDK. What is the, the function of, of the Bosch XDK within the, the Bosch portfolio? What, do you, what does that typically get used? Well, it has the advantage that uh, inside that, that uh, this um, small sensor, it's like a small box, you can see that, 
we have uh, more than, I think, nine uh, different sensors that are sensing, and um, you have an embedded system that you can use also for programming in C and C++, but there are also some Eclipse tools by which you can, I'm not a programmer, yeah, and I, I do not really like C programming, you know, but there are some other open source tools by which you can easily, quickly, in 10 minutes, program it and use it for proof of concept. You can communicate with Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and this is exactly what was one of the reasons we, uh, we used it here in this case. That fits perfectly. Well, one of the other things we show in this particular diagram in here is really uh, the concept of a, a network red zone and a network green zone, that sort of branch between OT and IT. Is that important within the factory environments? Is that significant to how you have to design your, your messaging flow? Uh, yeah, because uh, um, basically you cannot transmit um, all kind of data because you, you have to keep a certain security. You have to, um, you, you can't allow that, for example, devices which you do not have, uh, in, let me say, uh, coming from different suppliers or even with different softwares, packages and patches and so on, you cannot really control it or you have to control it, but to be secure, you keep it separate from the rest of the corporate area. So um, in this case, uh, you have to manage the flow of the data in a certain uh, in a certain content, in a certain format, the notation, and so on. So, using, for example, the MQTT telemetry was perfectly uh, working for this use case and for this situation. And you can also open up, for example, if you like, like we are doing, uh, uh, having a, um, a firewall, you can open up just only one port. So you keep this communication trans um, of, of the data quite secure, really secure. Were there things that you learned uh, through the course of the POC that you can share with the audience here today? Yeah, I learned that on paper it was easy to draw. <laughs> yeah. it, it took on Monday afternoon only a couple of minutes. We draw plenty of ideas. It was really nice and say, yeah, and let's do and this and this. And we say, okay, but it's Monday. We have to finish end of the week. And we finished on Thursday afternoon, just one day before. But never the, uh, nevertheless, we had also to design since the beginning uh, the structure of how, for example, the data he needs to be packed into a payload. Because if you forget, for example, some details, you will, yeah, you will <laughs> never uh, finish having uh, loops and, and make um, bug searches and so on, bugs in the data, of course. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really important to have this. Yeah, there were a number of iterations that were happening during the process of that week. So we, we saw that process of really starting to, to think small around this and continue to add and iterate components on there. There are things that ended up in this final slide that really weren't in, it in our original uh, scope and uh, desirability to, or to be able to tie into some of the existing applications and the application frameworks within Bosch, like Ditto or into PPM. Yep. Yeah, we are using, for example, Ditto uh, for our digital twins. We are really uh, stressing a lot because we see in the future also here as a strategical uh, benefit to have these kinds. So that's why it was important to feed somehow data from the physical things into the digital twin. So feeding this data, make it easy and accelerating, once again accelerating, this transmission, uh, I mean, you need to have a sort of stack that can be really flexible enough to implement these. So for us, it was really success to see the data exactly coming in where they have to be. So what are some of the considerations when you talk about adopting these open source frameworks? What are things that you're doing now at Bosch to, to drive this community forward? Yeah, first of all, making internally, because we have our internal customer, yeah, our team is not developing for external. So internally making a lot of advertising. Advertising because we are not a big team, but really we are, let me say, trying to, um, to, to make mm, others come to us and say, you know, we have a similar use case in our plan. We would like to extend what you have done so far and uh, mm, share your experience with us. So we are uh, also mentoring other plants and other experts and programmers and, and other vetoes like me, you know, in other plants, doing exactly this. And um, for example, we are organizing now in June a hackathon where we invite from all over the world Bosch colleagues. Uh, it's basically an internal hackathon. And we, for example, use this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this tech, this integration stack, just to, to show them how easy it is for them also to yeah, work on that, even if they are not really, uh, it's not their daily task to do this. Yeah. 
So one of the things that I thought was interesting as we came to the end of this and we looked across the, the partners that were involved in this, each one of the partners brought their own set of unique skills around that. You know, Bosch with this incredible knowledge around its own industry domain, Red Hat with the knowledge around the information technology frameworks and platform as a service, Eurotech with their messaging and operational technology expertise, and Cloudera with its data and management. It really took a whole set of expertise to bring and execute on this vision. Did that surprise you when you when you saw that, or was that more of what you were expecting to see? I mean, it's expecting me. I mean, I was expecting to have this because I think, as also David said at the beginning, I think you cannot have everything from beginning to end developed by your own. You will invent the wheel twice and three times and more times. So everybody is bringing in, in this mm, community, in this uh, uh, yeah com open source community, the expertise that they have and the experience and also the benefits because um, I liked the, the motto that I saw here, and I made it also on my T-shirt, uh, on a red T-shirt. It's um, open source is the gravity for good data, uh, for good ideas, sorry, for good ideas. And I think this um, works as well also for best practices. So, yeah, open source as a best practice should be beneficial also for others as well. Great. Vito, thank you very much. I th thank you. Um, this has been a great thank you session. It's great sharing from the partners in here. Um, I think with that, uh, I'm going to leave you here with the webinar link. So if you want to see that integrated demo, uh, that's a short URL at go.cloudera.com, and that's LP equals 1750. Uh, and if you have any questions for any of us here, the partners that are on the stage, uh, please, IOTquestions at redhat.com. And with that, thank you very much.